Can no, I think it did. did no, I think it did mention that there was one they didn't think was likely to get picked. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one you wanted to go to in the morning, but that one might be helpful for us. Hebrews versus one. You might find things that you could bring them up. So if your son's still undecided, that's not. I haven't looked at it uh, <laughs> tomorrow, but okay. Yeah, I'll go through it. I'm fine. Well, it says it's 4 30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started and wait uh, for anything else to happen. I'm Susie Ingalls from South Carolina Legal Services. And thanks to y'all for being here to uh, learn a little bit more about the product that we created on learnthelaw.org. And I want to, um, uh, first of all, uh, mention Leslie Fisk and Vladimir Mash. Tell me how to pronounce your last name. Maslanchuk. Maslanchuk. I've known him for years and I still have trouble with that last name. But anyway, thanks to y'all for um, being here. Uh, in the last session, we talked about the process of uh, creating classrooms to put on learnthelaw.org. And so um, in this session, I'm going to talk about the actual product that happened as a result of what we did. First of all, uh, shout out to Calif, who was a big piece of creating learnthelaw.org. And um, we actually found learnthelaw.org because it was done with a technology innovation grant with Legal Services Corporation. And we wanted to do some online classrooms. <clears throat> we wanted it to be funded by a TIG grant. So we looked at some of the previous projects that had been funded, and that's how we found Learn the Law. So that was a, a really uh, great thing that happened for us because I'm a big fan of the platform. Um, so. What we have here on the screen is our lawhelp.org page, and this is where uh, most of our clients and, and people who uh, work with legal aid or um, are you know, um, uh, people who are you know, looking for legal information in South Carolina, this is where they end up. So this is how we um, guide them to the the website. So what we planned to do initially was five classrooms and we wanted to have a hook so that when people were uh, going to the classroom to learn that they would have some reason to stay tuned once they were there. And that's how uh, Clark came into being and we talked uh, a good bit in the last session about our work with Law Hub uh, creating the character of Clark. But what's really neat about that before we get into these um, classrooms that we've just done is we now have this character and so we're able to make this really be an, on an ongoing series of classrooms that all have that same hook of that um, character that we really uh, like and, and think keeps people looking at least long enough to learn the basics of a particular area of law that a client needs to know. So, this, uh, the connection with lawhelp.org takes you directly to our classrooms on Learn the Law, but you can also go straight to learnthelaw.org and just click on South Carolina and our, our, um, our classrooms come up that way. And you can see here that we actually, we started with a grant for five classrooms, but I think we ended up with actually seven classrooms in the end. And so that was kind of a, a neat thing. Two of the classrooms, I think, don't have the video yet, if I'm not mistaken. But we you know, realized along the way that some of the classrooms would be more for the lawyer and some would be more for the client. Most of the classrooms are for the client, but we have one or two that are for the lawyers. And so our audience was for, um, was for not just clients that might need to know about their legal rights, but it was also for pro bono lawyers because there's lots of lawyers in South Carolina who want to do pro bono work. They know how to be a lawyer. They know how to go to court. They just might not know how to do a particular kind of case that we do a lot of at Legal Aid and, and we kind of have a, 
corner on the market of that legal knowledge. And all they need to do is have a resource of where to go to quickly learn, okay, what do I do if they've, you know, referred a case to me and it's about doing an unemployment appeal? Well, we now have a run the law classroom on unemployment appeals. And so they can easily go and do that because most lawyers that have that legal training, you know, they can go to court. They just don't always know all the law and they're not real familiar with the, um, you know, what happens in court. Like I hear uh, pro bono lawyers all the time who might get assigned a family court case and they're like, I have no idea what to do in family court. And so that's where I think learning the law uh, comes in. And I just want to show you, here's, I if that's the one I meant to click on. See who, unemployment benefit appeals. There we go. And so what we do on Learn the Law, which is a, a really neat website, the reason we like it so much, as we mentioned um, in the previous session, is because as technology changes and improves and there's all these new bells and whistles and gizmos, you can still use those, and whatever you create with those, you can dump into your classroom on Learn the Law. So you're still keeping up with the kind of things that we find people are really drawn to or that really helps people or that's really the, the latest thing. And we can incorporate that, big, that back into a classroom that, that we already have. And as the law changes, if it changes, we can go back in and update from that change too. And it's really easy once you've done the basic, or the basic classroom. So you can see here on the unemployment benefit appeals, this is, you know, there's a sort of a step-by-step -step explanation of everything that you do in the unemployment benefit appeals. And what's really cool is Learn the Law actually has classrooms on how to build a classroom. And so you can go in there and it tells you all the different things you need to do. I mean, I had to learn how to embed a video into the classroom and, and those kind of things. So I don't do it often enough, so I always have to relearn it when I need to uh, embed a video. But I want to just go ahead and show you uh, one of our little Clark videos that every classroom starts with. And some of you who may have been in the other session have seen one of these, but let's just see a new one. We have our disclaimer. Full screen is unavailable. Just click on YouTube. Uh, Click on the text on the top of the video. What? Uh, Click on the word YouTube. Blah. <laughs> oh. that too. I didn't know work. so much after all. <laughs> There's a standard disclaimer. Unemployment law in under five minutes. We're going to explain South Carolina unemployment law to you in under five minutes. First, an overview. Unemployment is a system of benefits, money, to help workers and their families avoid the negative impacts of job loss. It's temporary, and it's designed to bridge the gap until the worker can find a new job. The amount of unemployment comes from a formula based on wages you've earned in the last 15 months. Part 1. Eligibility. There are five requirements to receive unemployment. One, earnings or monetary eligibility. This means that you must have made a certain amount of wages over the last 15 months. You can find the exact amount at the SC Department of Employment and Workforce. Two, you have to be able to work. Three, you have to be available for work. Four, you have to be actively seeking work. This includes a requirement that you search for work through the Department of Employment and Workforce website each week. Five, and finally, you need to have separated from your job for certain reasons. You don't qualify for unemployment if you voluntarily quit, unless you can prove you had good cause to quit. Good cause to quit can be very hard to prove, so it's a good idea to try everything you can before quitting a job. You were discharged for cause. For example, if you were often late, or made many careless mistakes. You still qualify for unemployment if you were unable to meet the employer's goals or if you didn't have the skills to do the work. You were discharged for misconduct, like theft, damaging equipment, cursing at a boss or coworkers, or you fail a drug test. There are a few exceptions to these rules. 
such as if you had to leave your job because your spouse's job was transferred to another city, you are a victim of domestic violence, or because you or another family member is ill or disabled, you may still be eligible for benefits in these situations. Part 2. The Process You apply for unemployment on the website of the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. In the application, you will answer questions about why you were separated from the job, the agency will contact both you and the employer to ask more questions. Then they make an initial determination, which they will mail to you. This will state whether you are granted unemployment or not, and why. If you are denied, you only have 10 calendar days to file an appeal. That's 10 calendar days, including weekends. The clock starts ticking on the day the determination was sent, not when it was received by you. If you miss this deadline, you have lost your appeal and you will not get unemployment. You can send the appeal by mail, online, or by fax. To prepare the appeal, first, contact Legal Aid. You may qualify for free help. Second, request a copy of your claims file from the department. Third, gather evidence to help you prove your claim, like witnesses who can testify that you were actually terminated and did not quit, or time records to show you were not late. Fourth, the hearing will be held by telephone. Send your evidence to the department and the employer 24 hours in advance. The hearing is like a miniature trial where the hearing officer is trying to figure out whether you are eligible for benefits based on the evidence. At the hearing, be prepared to tell your side of the story, have your witnesses present to testify, and ask that any evidence you sent in be considered. Unemployment cases can be hard to win on your own. Contact SCLS at the earliest opportunity to see if we can help. Now see, that's just the basics of an unemployment case. And you can see that what we put in there were all of the uh, main points that we see as being problems for clients. For example, they don't always know that that 10 days thing is 10 calendar days, and very often they come to us and their time's up. And so hopefully, the more uh, people see these, the more they'll um, the more they'll be aware of their rights. And that's really uh, the main that's the main thing that we're trying to get across. So let's start with slide here. Okay, so this is sort of our iconic meet Clark and learn the law. And so we did crib off the name of learnthelaw.org um, in that respect. But I think it's very simple. And with the simple videos starting every classroom, then we know um, that people are going to at least get that much knowledge. And those videos, that's what you got the TIG grant to create these these videos for the different That's right. That was start the biggest the piece of the grant that we got um, because that was the most expensive part. Now, part of it was the money for, like, our time as attorneys, and there was, you know, materials and some travel and some things like that, but the biggest piece of the grant besides our time as attorneys was that technical piece of creating the videos and um, <clears throat> we had uh, Adam Stosky from Law Hub on earlier in the previous session uh, talking a good bit about that and that was really quite a process but we came up with Clark and I think he's a good character and, and with the testing that we have done so far um, there's usually a lot of smiles on people's faces because they stay watching it and so they're going to at least get that much information and about I guess it was in January we uh, did a presentation in Greenville in the upstate to 600 lawyers about this so they would know here's some tools that you can use as a pro bono volunteer and um, to a person and everyone that I talked to afterwards said okay I, I think I can do one of those you know I think I could do um, a debt collection defense I think I could do an unemployment appeal it's, it's easier than I thought you know there's there's a quick way to learn it, and it's something that they can do at their own pace. You know, they don't have to go somewhere and do a CLE on it. They can 
look at it at their office or at their home or uh, anything like that. So uh, some of the slides that I have here to uh, talk about uh, were, I have to give a shout out to Kathy Daniels from uh, Statewide Legal Services. Is Connecticut, she, yeah. Yeah, and she was a big part of creating one of the laws. So when I first started uh, making presentations about this, I, I called her and I said, you know, you got any great presentation material and so some of this is what she shared with me so I do have to give a shout out uh, to her on that and this is really what I've already said about how when somebody has a legal problem they just need some resources and some resources for our clientele that they can find uh, easy to understand so we have five online classrooms launched in 2019 with that TIG grant which we talked about earlier um, getting your landlord to make repairs is one of them. This is, I think, really important, why online learning? Uh, because right now, a lot of our clients, they don't have online access. They may have a smartphone that they can uh, uh, access this from, some of them. A lot of our clients are going to the library for their internet access. But, and so we recognize that. But we also recognize how quickly things are changing with that. And there's going to come a time real soon that our clients start to age on up and age out and other clients come forward. And they're going to have access to the internet one way or another. And so we want to make sure that we're ready for that. Um, I think there was a time when, when I thought, well, you know, online is great, but our clients don't, you know, don't really have that access. But I had to really change or improve, I guess, that attitude and realize it. That's going to change, just like everything does uh, with technology. This is a cartoon that I stole from Kathy. Uh, uh, and I love it. I'm not a procrastinator. I just prefer doing all my work in a deadline-induced panic. And this uh, definitely describes how these classes ended up. And we were talking earlier that we created teams to do them. But in the end, it was each of the five of us who were each in charge of a classroom, it was a team of one at the end. I mean, it was up to you to make it final and make it happen so it was ready uh, to be launched. And, and these are launched and on the website now. Um, but this is why, you know, I think we are lawyers. We have caseloads. It was really hard to find the time uh, to do it. And I think uh, hopefully that doesn't show in the final product. Uh, but it might, but the, again, the neat thing about learnthelaw.org is you can always go back and fix things. So as we're testing and doing stuff like that, it, you know, somebody might say, you know, you spelled something wrong. It could be something as small as that, but it's real easy to go back and change it. Um, and I really believe in this. I mean, I know that the sit and get type of uh, teaching is still relevant. I have a husband and a daughter who are both high school teachers. Um, but they are really using technology much in the same way that Dave Yearwood was talking about um, this morning. And I was sitting there in my mind thinking, Lesson and I both, because her uh, mom is a, a teacher. And we're thinking, I know that they're doing some of this, but boy, these are some great ideas to pass along to just the high school uh, teachers to be incorporating uh, technology into the classroom. So um, I really believe that these are a great tool to incorporate into law school classes. Even the online training, um, I know my daughter who is getting her um, MBA right now, she has some classes that are online, but I still think that they're not quite as engaging or um, maybe helpful as they could be. And that's something that we've really tried to um, incorporate into ours. So we've got something for everyone and, and here's just a little bit of a list of all the learning styles that we tried to address because you know our clients are everything from you know I guess even small children sometimes but certainly high school all the way up to people getting social security. You know we have quite the onslaught right now of older people who are starting to get social security and suddenly they there's a student loan that they either didn't know about or forgot about and it's been taken out of their social security so we really need an online classroom for that but so there's a wide range not just of age but of uh, ability and education and things like that so we try to make sure there's something for everybody but again that goes back to testing um, I, this was a you know a 2016 study here 
but it just goes back to what I said about um, things are changing very fast and it's even changing with our clientele who last year might not have had a cell phone or might not have had intercept, internet access, but now they do. I have surprisingly a lot of clients who come into my office and they've got that cell phone right there and uh, sometimes they forget to turn it off. But uh, so more and more I'm seeing even older people who I would have thought probably would maybe reject the whole cell phone thing, but they have them. Here's just a little shout out again to Learn the Law and you folks that created it. We thank you for doing that. It's great. And this I is the you. home page where uh, you can go directly to find our classrooms and it's real easy to do. You do have to um, sign up and sign in to, I think, um, well this is for the people who are creating the classes right here. Mm -hmm. Anybody can go in and look at the classes, so that's cool. And then I just had a couple of examples of the different things that are on there, not just things that we have, but things that other folks are doing. Um, so, so you've got videos, you've got the cartoons we have, all kinds of things. Here were just some visuals that some of the other classrooms have. So there's any number of ways to make it really helpful to people. Um, this, uh, I love this cartoon, uh, no, that's not how you're supposed to use it. Um, I think this is a user-friendly platform and you can make it even more user-friendly based on how you do your classrooms. But what I really love is it's creator-friendly because we laugh about not maybe being the highest tech people in the world. We'd like to be, but um, we aren't always. And it's just so easy to use. It's just a regular attorney that's, you know, trying to um, stay up to date on technology and, and the different ways to incorporate that into our practice of law. Um, I really appreciate how easy it really is. And everybody can use it in different ways. Um, this is, uh, I'm not, I can't remember who did this. It's called Represent. Uh, Northeastern. Is it Inkmore? Northeastern University Law School. Northeastern, okay. Yeah. And this is a really neat little thing that they do with kind of the cartoon characters. And it goes through, um, uh, you know, just a, uh, a legal uh, lawsuit from start to finish type thing, going to court. And so I really like that. Um, but also, one of the things I'll talk about here in just a few minutes is some other ways to show uh, going to court. Uh, yeah, this really is an innovative approach, but I'm afraid we can't consider it. It's never been done. <laughs> That's a great cartoon. Um, and it had not been done at legal services, but lucky for us, it had been done at other legal aid firms. We could show what had been done, and so the people that we have to uh, get the approval uh, from to do a project like this and to apply for the grant on, uh, luckily for us, we're, we're quick, to, uh, quick to agree. And so we will be uh, tomorrow, I guess, um, submitting another grant to do another six classrooms. And in fact, this summer we're doing uh, some classrooms on legal issues in disaster recovery and there are some <clears throat> other um, you know videos and things like that out there that will I think be useful and informative for us but also in our particular state there are some differences and so that's why it's neat to be able to have a place to put your own uh, your own information in case it's different so this um, trying new things trying to break things and all that. I love that idea. And so one of the things that we're proposing to do with our next grant is to do this kind of a courtroom scene. And we have a courtroom scene like this right now in some of our classrooms, which I can show in a minute. But you see over here is Clark. And so what we hope to do is have a courtroom scene in our pro bono uh, program here in South Carolina I was really excited about the classrooms and wanted to try this out because they felt like you know the courtroom scenes admittedly are a little you know tough to watch they're not real exciting and all that and so what we are going to now try to do is take Clark who everybody seems to like and you know kind of trust a little bit I guess and we'll in uh, sort of embed a little soliloquies from Clark to comment on and guide you through some of the things that are happening in the hearing that you're watching in the classroom. So that's going to be a cool thing. 
Okay, well, we'll do that audience participation in just a minute. Uh, let's see. So now I'm going to show you, since this class is about the product itself, or this session is about the product itself, I'm going to show you three of the things that we have uh, three cent examples of what we have in the classroom and there's more I think one of the things that you won't see is the um, audio that I was mentioning in the last session which we inserted into the debt collection defense classroom and it's basically sort of the anatomy of defending a debt collection lawsuit um, as told by me to one of my clients because I had repeated that like 50 times probably in my legal <laughs> career so I decided to record it and uh, and Vlad put it on YouTube for us, and it's, uh, as I said earlier, I was shocked to find out a month or so ago that it's had 20,000 views, and uh, <laughs> so we need to do more of those. <laughs> you know, when it first was on there, and um, uh, it, had, it had a number of views, a lot of them, but then when our, um, web, uh, our other web person at uh, Legal Services was showing me some other things, he went to that and said, oh my gosh, you've got, had 20,000 views on that in just the last two years, but still to me, even for two years, that's a lot. So, um, so that's really neat, but it's not nearly as engaging as the video. So here's one that's uh, really now I'm going to show you on housing repairs. Housing repairs. You have a right to a livable home. When you rent a home in South Carolina, your landlord has an obligation to keep that home safe and healthy. This is sometimes called the warranty of habitability. This means that there can be no threats to health and safety or other serious problems with the home. There must be access to essential services like water and heating and important appliances. Examples of unsafe or unhealthy conditions include no heat or hot water, leaky plumbing, mold, pests, missing door locks, and electrical problems. If your house is unsafe or unhealthy because of a condition like this, your landlord has to fix it. It's the law. First of all, as long as you are living in the home, it's best to keep paying rent. If you withhold rent, your landlord may file for eviction. You will then have to raise the issues of repairs while defending an eviction case. Step 1. Notify the landlord. Send a polite and clearly written letter to your landlord asking for repairs. Include a list of all of the repairs needed, when the damage occurred, and a reasonable deadline to make the repairs. Usually, it's best to give your landlord at least 14 days. Your letter also needs to say what you're going to do if repairs aren't made. So you'll need to make this decision now. You have two options. If you want to leave, you have this option if the problems with your home materially affect health and safety. They can't be minor problems. You also should have given your landlord written notice of the problems and at least 14 days to fix them. It's best to send any letter certified mail or send it with your rent check so you have proof the landlord received it. Be sure to keep a copy. You can create a letter using a tool on SCLS's website. If you want to stay and try to make your landlord fix your home, you can file a lawsuit asking the court to order your landlord to make repairs and possibly to award you damages. You can do this with or without a lawyer. You can create papers to file in court using a tool on SCLS's website. Step 2. Evidence. You need to make a record of the problems with your home. The best way to do this is to take lots of pictures. Make sure that you document all of the problems and that there is plenty of light to see the problems clearly. Record the date that you took the photos. Step 3. If the landlord does nothing. If you decide to leave, you can simply move out and stop paying rent. You don't need to file anything in court, but it is an option. There's more info on that on SCLS's website. Once you move, you should write to the landlord to ask for your security deposit and prepaid rent back. A sample letter is on SCLS's website. If you decide to stay, you can file a complaint with the court. It will need to be served on your landlord. The court can have this done for you for a small fee, or you can have it done yourself. Once your landlord is served, they have 30 days to respond, called an answer. 
Once the court has received the answer, they will schedule a trial. If the condition of the house is very bad, for example, you don't have heat, electricity, or running water, you can ask the court for an emergency hearing to decide whether your rent should be reduced or if your landlord should be ordered to make repairs immediately. When you come to court, make sure to bring all the evidence you collected. Print out any pictures you took. If you have any witnesses, make sure they come too. You won't be able to use written statements from witnesses. SCLS has created an online resource to help you take action to get repairs from your landlord. Here you can create the court forms you need, letters to your landlord requesting repairs, contact information for city and county agencies, and more. Okay, so again, a quick, easy, uh, simple video that you feel like um, uh, once the client or the you know, just general public, uh, member of the general public has seen that, you feel like if they can last through that video, they know a good bit about what their legal rights are. And at least they know that they can uh, get help from us, uh, they can get a lawyer, and um, hopefully get a lawyer. Uh, but two things that you notice when you look at that particular video. One of them is, and I have no idea how to better address this problem, but you notice that the dates is 2017. That that's how long we've been doing this. Um, so there's probably a way to figure out how to do that date thing uh, a little bit better. But, uh, let's see. Okay, So one of the other things about that classroom and all the other ones, it talks about the forms and everything. Well, that's what's so cool about uh, these classrooms is you can have the forms on there too. So we like highlighting our little videos because that's how we get the, the hook to get people in there to watch it and kind of stick with it for a minute. But as you see over here, you've got all these steps that you need to take. And then here's like the forms and advanced materials. So. Um, There's all the materials you need right there, the PDF, complaint, answer. Um, and so the neat thing there, uh, again, is a whole list of items that you can use. And every, every area of the law is different. The forms are different. Sometimes you don't need forms, sometimes you do. I believe that this one has an A to J author got an interview. Doesn't it, Vlad? I think so. So the, um, the A2J author, again, obviously, shout out to Kelly on that. Um, we have one of those on the debt collection uh, defense. And as I mentioned earlier uh, in, in the previous session, we created this uh, guided interview and it was like so complicated, which is great for lawyers. They can write a nice long uh, answer to a complaint and have all the affirmative defenses and counterclaims and, and really address some of the problems that uh, are there in the debt collection uh, side of it. But we realized when we, um, after the law students that were helping us had done all this great work, um, we realized it was way too complicated for a regular person. And one of the big things in these particular kinds of lawsuits, anyway, um, it is that it's a claim and delivery lawsuit. So the person it is uh, being sued for uh, the, not just the money that is owed on a loan, but they're being sued for the repossession of the property that they listed uh, as collateral, which it typically in these cases that we focused on here is um, household goods, really. And so what people really needed to know, we kind of toned it down to the basic thing that people needed to know, and that was that it's okay if you don't have the property anymore. 
because usually this is property that is going to deteriorate, it's going to be thrown away, or it's broken, or something like that. But our clients will get really scared into being worried that they're going to go to jail because they don't have that property. And part of that is because that's what the creditors tell them. And in South Carolina, in uh, summary court, the finance company can be uh, represented by a non-lawyer. They can authorize someone who is like a local manager of the local uh, loan company to actually be the quote unquote lawyer in court. And they don't have all the rules and regulations that we do about uh, being truthful about things. And sometimes they, you know, we get clients all the time who think they're going to jail. They're just scared to death. And all they need to do is this thing we call the property list. And, oh uh, gosh, that's a little video of me talking about the property list. But anyway, here's the property list. And all they have to do is look at the complaint that they've been sued with, and it lists the property that's supposedly going to be, you know, repossessed. But, uh, you know, the, the clue phone there is that the finance company doesn't really want the broken stuff. They want the money. Yeah. And so they worry the people to death about not having the property or something like that. And that makes the person or the customer pay the money because they're afraid they're going to lose their stuff. And so what is important for people to know is that they could list all this stuff that's listed in the complaint and they say what the value of it is uh, that was listed in the complaint, but then here we tell them the current value of the item. Well, most often it's zero or it might be one dollar and we tell people, hey, you know, if you uh, gave them an interest in your CD player, it, you know, good luck finding a place to buy a CD player these days, but you know, maybe they have them at Walmart for $10 or something like that. And so you put that in there. You, know, you said go to Walmart and figure out what, it's, what it will cost you to get these things that you don't even have anymore and put it in that column. And so what they can do, and the classroom tells them this, is if they just complete that property list and if they do nothing but take the property list to court with them and say, you know, here's what the value of the property is. I don't, here's what I have, here's what I don't have. And they can you know, be real successful in getting out of there with obviously not going to jail, but certainly not worried about their, um, they're going to go to jail for some property that they don't have that they've long ago uh, thrown away. But this is where, when we were doing the guided interview, it got very complicated to um, create that piece of the pleading about, you know, list every piece of property. Now, what was the value in the complaint? What is the value now? And so we, the students were able to, like, do that mm -hmm. in the guided interview, but it was just so complicated that we said, if we can barely do it, these clients aren't going to be able to do it. So that's when we went back to just having them be able, in this classroom here, to just print out that property list and as long as they can at least do that, just that one thing, they're good. Now, if they can do all the other stuff that we have in the classroom and learn about all this, the frequently asked questions, you know, what comes next, going to court, and all that, then you know, that's even better if they can <clears throat> learn even more about what they need to do. But at least we've done just that one thing. So let's go back to... So I have a question oh, yeah, sure. about the guided interview, and I yeah. thought I saw a hot docs down there. Is that what it is where you hope you put your cursor over that and the guided is a prompt to say what goes in the blank, or is it accompanied by an audio guiding them through the... No, there's no audio on, on the guided interview that so, I know of. I suppose, you, I don't know, can you put... Audio in there? I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious could. what the guided interview oh, okay. is. Is it hot docs or something like that where you hover over and it just pops? Put your first name in this blank. Is that what yes, it is? Or, or to explain a little The hot docs is the documents that you get once you complete the, the mm -hmm. interview. Right. So the interview kind of prompts you through like steps. Uh, you know, put your name here, your address here, what the issue yeah. is. Okay. And once you finish it, you get the documents that are pre-filled based on your answers. Yeah. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. Sorry, I can't seem to. I'm going to brought that up somewhere else already. 
but yeah. Um, yeah, so the guy that interviewed has a little person that walks you down the road and you answer all the questions and at the end a pleading pops out. So okay, nice. cool. But for us and for our clients, we need a little bit simpler pleading on that one. Uh, oh yeah, you could wind up down a rabbit hole mm -hmm. on some of those types of right. cases, yeah. Okay. And so now I'm going to just show you, um, Leslie showed about five seconds of it in the last session, but this is a piece that in, is in the classroom that Leslie did on orders of protection, which is for uh, victims of domestic violence. And she gathered a bunch of tips for people, and they're such good tips that, again, if uh, someone who is a victim of domestic violence just listens to that part, they're going to really learn a lot of good stuff. So here's... Leslie Fisk. I'm an attorney at South Carolina Legal Services. Um, other attorneys and I have prepared a few tips to help you be prepared for your order of protection hearing. When you're in an order of protection hearing, you need to use specific words about the abuse. And so what I mean by that is not to use words that could be vague, like he showed out or she came at me, because those could mean different things. You want to use action words such as punch, shove, slap, Describe what happened. Um, talk about where on the body uh, you were hit if you were hit. Um, talk about your injuries. You can explain whether it was a closed fist or an open fist. If it's not too violent, you can um, show an example of, of the movement. Um, also, even though custody might be your primary concern, you are filing this because you do need an order of protection. So it is very important that you first focus on the abuse and why you need the order of protection before you talk about um, custody. Because if you go right in talking about custody, the judge is going to be concerned that custody is your only reason for filing this and think that you don't really need an order of protection. So you first need to establish that you do need that order of protection before you start talking about custody. If you have photos, make sure you get those off your phone. You need printed photos. Um, they could be either photographs or they could be copies printed from a computer, but the judge is not going to look at your phone, so make sure you get them off your phone. You should also bring a copy um, because the other side has the right to see a copy. If you have medical records, bring those and bring copies. But be aware that you might need to black out some important uh, personal information, such as the address where you're staying, um, if you don't want the abuser to know that. Also, your social security number might be on there, so just be careful about what sensitive data might be on there. Um, if there are any witnesses, uh, you should ask them to come to the hearing with you. Let them know the hearing date as soon as you get it. Ideally, a witness would have seen the abuse, but we know a lot of times there are no witnesses to domestic violence. Um, but there may be witnesses who called the police for you or who you ran to a neighbor's house. They called law enforcement for you. Um, they called an ambulance for you. See, that is the basic stuff of getting an order of protection in South Carolina. That's the basic stuff you need to know. <clears throat> Leslie's very experienced in that. And uh, again, a lot of what we put in these classrooms is these are the things that clients come into us and this is what they didn't know or what they didn't do and we're making sure that they um, that they know that. Okay, yeah, at the time that we, uh, okay, can I make a comment? Um, one of the things that I really liked about Learn the Law is you can incorporate both these high-tech features such as that video that Law Hub created with the animation and then very low-tech features which was Vlad with a camera saying, do you want to talk about it now? And I was like, okay, I guess so. And then he, you know, did the nice little thing where he blacked out the moments that I was saying, uh, um, you know. Um, so I really liked that it could incorporate all sorts of different levels of technology. Yeah, for sure. And uh, this is a summary court hearing. And again, this is why I told you a little bit about what our next level stuff we hope is going to be with the courtroom hearings and incorporating our own character into that to kind of help you understand what's going on. Because even when it's a basic hearing, 
and you're wanting people to know kind of what it feels like to be in a real courtroom, which is, because I like cartoons and, and animation and all that, but I also feel like people really need to know what it's going to feel like to some degree when they're in that courtroom, especially if they haven't been in one before. So if we can marry the real courtroom with the animation that is, is helpful to people, I think it's going to be a neat thing. This is a, one of those claim and delivery hearings that we uh, with how these hearings go and I've been able to change it a little bit just by being doggedly after it but sometimes you know there's only so much that you can do but this is how these hearings really go and but this example of a hearing is where the person whose property is supposedly going to be taken has seen a <coughs> classroom and kind of knows a little bit about what they're supposed to do. Um, person who's being sued, and Mr. Seymour Bucks is the non-lawyer from the finance company. Ms. Blackford, do you know what's going on here today? Uh, yes, I think so, Your Honor. And, um, well, before Mr. Bucks tells me about the case, do you want to talk to him uh, to see if you can come to some type of agreement on how to pay this so I won't have to issue a pickup order? For your property that might be better than you know losing all your property um no no your honor um i don't have any money to pay but before we start does mr bucks have a non-lawyer authorization mr bucks your honor we have one file um, authorization when i first started doing this kind of work none of the magistrate courts cared whether or not this person had a non-lawyer authorization but there's South Carolina law that deals with to what degree this hearing is binding on you if the person, you know, if, if you don't raise that issue. And, and what, what uh, the judges were doing at the time was saying, well, we have one on file for this company. Well, they might have one on file, but it's like four years old, and it's not the person who was standing in front of them. So that was something that we were uh, able to kind of educate our magistrates on. I would like to see it and have a copy before we start. May I approach? Yes, please. Please. Well, Your Honor, Ms. Blackford hasn't made a payment in two months, and she now owes $1,246.32. So we're asking for a pickup order. Pickup order, which means. We're not really necessarily asking for money. We're going to come get her. We want you to give us an order that says we can go get her stuff. And this is what um, these folks were doing all the time. And they, they had no idea what they were supposed to do, really, or what this person's rights were. Okay, Ms. Blackford, is that right? Have you not paid in two months? Um, he doesn't have anything showing my account and the charges and payments. He hasn't given me credit for what I've paid. Also, I don't have any of the property on the list except for this DVD player, and he can have that. I brought it with me. Judge, she can't just get rid of property. That's against the law. Okay, well, what law is that? Against the law, because that's what they've been, like, kind of trained to say, and they're trained to, well, you know, it's against the law for them to not have the property anymore. And there's, uh, there is a law about that, but it has absolutely no application uh, to this. That law doesn't apply to my situation because my property was old and broken and I had to throw it away. I didn't sell it or anything. Here's a list of the property and what I see the value is. I understand that he can get a judgment for the value of the property. Okay. Property list. Okay. That's perfect timing. We have 10 minutes left for questions. <laughs> or... For further audience participation, you can pull out your iPhone or your smartphone and go to learnthelaw.org and find one of our classrooms to look at yourself, which is neat that 
as our clients more and more have the opportunity to look at things like that on their smartphone, then um, you know, there's hopefully by then going to be a lot more of this uh, for them to be looking at. Yes, ma'am. Um, how do you just sort of make sure these things are current, they've got the current forms, is there someone in-house who's assigned to each of them, or oh, just more your maintenance of yeah. making sure it's That's all right. Good. Each of our classrooms were had a team leader, basically, that was in charge of it. That's why I said we ended up with a team of one. <laughs> and, um, and so the unit head of each of those um, subject matter areas is the one that's in charge of keeping it up to date which is so neat about learning the law because they don't really, if somebody new comes in and it's not the same person that was there when the classroom was created, it's really so easy to go in there and fix whatever needs to be fixed or update whatever needs to be updated. And again, that really groovy feature about here's how to build a classroom or create a classroom and here's how to make an edit and so forth like that. I mean, I had a little bit of a learning curve, but it wasn't too bad at all. That's a good point, though, that as we gather a bigger and bigger library of these, mm -hmm. perhaps we need to include it in the job description of those unit heads, but by the way, keep all these up to date. <laughs> there's a change. Or if the front screen has, you know, current dates on it. I mean, mm -hmm. you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Back, you have no idea how old this is. Mm -hmm. You know, that's but a so really great Always point. sticking dates on there is just like, I, I'm yeah. like rabid about it. But yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. It, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a huge problem with, with, with uh, forms. Um, and, and even, and, and you know, we, we were getting like beat up on that. It's like, well, you got no system for maintenance, you know, and, and did a little research and found out like, you know, half the courts have old forms on their websites, <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh yeah, we never, we never updated. We updated the forms like in the file, but we never put it up on the website or something like that. But they didn't care because they would accept it anyway. And so the whole idea of like keeping things up to date was like you know kind of lackadaisically enforced, um, but it's it's a huge problem. We can do better. Yeah, <laughs> hell it's yeah. a good idea to be able to maybe put on each classroom last updated on this. Yep. Day yeah, that's a really good idea. But so. the forms changed in my project um, just recently, and I was uh, kept putting off changing them. You know, and um, I was. Pleasantly surprised when I got around to it how easy it was to change the forms, but it's a good point 10 years from now if they're changed again and I'm no longer at legal services, somebody still mm -hmm. needs to be in charge of that. I think that's yeah, great. Yeah, and they need to be e able to easily figure out when was the last time it was changed. Yes. So I really like your yeah. idea. Of and that. then put it on their job evaluation, their annual evaluation. Did you update the, the Ooh, I like that. classrooms you're responsible Maybe. for? Maybe. Maybe I like that. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, we had said, I think, in the last session, some of y'all were there, but when uh, one of our classrooms of these five was the ABCs of guardianship, and in the middle of uh, doing that classroom, the guardianship law in South Carolina changed. Drastically. So, huh? <laughs> Drastically. Drastically, yes. Drastically. And so the guy who was our um, elder law unit head who was doing that, is that right? He was elder law unit head. Um, and he just had this crazy amount of work to do to go back and, you know, um, insert new stuff. But he was having to create those resources and that material anyway. And so um, putting it on the classroom was uh, really, I think, part of what made us go ahead and do it as soon, you know, as early as we did. And then this gets back to your question which is he then was uh, moved on to private practice and was no longer with us and so another person became in charge of that classroom for the finishing up of it but i thought it really turned out um, well she was able to um, kind of put on the finishing touches and, and get it all done so any other questions yes do you know of any um court help like county court help offices that are doing like pro se litigant resources are using learn the law or is it all legal services um, connected or law school connected mostly projects? Well, I haven't looked at it in a while so I would say yeah. go to the website and yeah. see who's using it yeah I mean we I have we created a classroom but my thought was that it could help with our courthouse with where pro se litigants come in and are asking the superior court clerks and they can just say, you yeah. know, 
Go ahead, well, um, we, you know, have done some uh, guided interviews with A to J author in South Carolina that are on our court's website, mm -hmm. and that was quite a process. <coughs> I think Vlad and Leslie maybe can speak to that, but that was quite a process to go through to get them to approve that mm -hmm. and all the testing and the files. It was quite a process, and so. Um, whether I don't know whether or not we would go through that ever again. Uh, <laughs> well, we have to have sad. all the people in place that are willing to do it, you know, on all sides. But yeah, y'all can maybe speak to. You know, it was a very interesting process. We at Legal Services are firmly in the camp of the victim, and where we're representing the victim, not the abuser. So, for example, we call it victim and abuser. <laughs> trying to be gender, gen, gender neutral and the court you know it's what's none of that it's petitioner and respondent and you know um you know so that's just one minor example of how everything and you know when you get too many lawyers in a room it's like no we can't say that about marriage because what if they were common law marriage well should we put something about common law marriage no nobody most people aren't common law married that will confuse people you know like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, they have all the forms up, <laughs> but they just, the forms aren't plain language, they're, you know, right. and there's just nothing yeah. really to help someone, and this seems like it's a, would be a wonderful compliment. So, it, we're totally aware of that, that, that oftentimes the idea that we can automate, oh, it's so easy to automate forms, is just opening up that can of worms and, <laughs> and starting the conversation, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. So. And I think that's part of why we really like using these classrooms, because, you know, at some point in a lot of these situations, people just need a lawyer. You know, they need somebody to help them fill out the form yeah. or something oh, yeah. like that. And so these are really, especially with the little videos, are really helpful to us when we like do a clinic. So we, you know, people come into a clinic and they trudge in after work or something like that. And we, you know, maybe we're standing up there going over the, you know, uh, simple divorce that they're <coughs> filed for themselves or something like that. But if you start out with a cute video, they're like, oh, okay, this isn't going to be too bad. And so at least they've gotten at least that much information. So yeah. I think there's going to be, you know, continue to be, they are already, but I think they'll continue to be more and more helpful. And we'll be able to do more different kinds of outreach and presentations. It won't just be that same old, you know, the divorce or the, you know, um, I'm trying to think of what some of our typical ones are, but certainly the divorce is one of our typical clinics that we do. Also, the classrooms can be used to teach law students who could better, who could sit down with the pro se people and help them fill it out. Mm -hmm. So it could bridge that gap um, or could, and can teach pro bono attorneys. So if it is a subject that cannot be simplified enough for your average pro se person, you probably could still educate a bunch of law students about it. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like in my experience with the law students um, from here at USC, and again, Gary, shout out to Professor Chambliss and her students from yep. the uh, Nelson Mullins um, Center on Professionalism, they, they were terrific and they were very willing to learn the AJ author uh, program. In fact, I think they, the law school actually ended up buying that program, didn't they? Well, they, we had a server with it. Yeah, we charge you a lot for that, so, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was free, it's free for it's free. Yeah. <laughs> and we, ho we have a server, we host it, but we're looking at the hosted solution. Yeah. yeah, that's we're good. I know we have that legal aid, but they were having to come over to our office, and then we would have to, you know, say, oh, it needs to say this and this and this, and then our person who was doing it for us would have to translate that into his own stuff, and then he would have questions, and that's, I think, why they finally decided to try to, um, to, try to do that. But it was, it was really great because they really were learning by teaching. I think um, about the different topics that they were uh, creating those guided interviews on. So it was a neat process to watch, and it helped me a lot too. Helped mm -hmm. me learn. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, well, um, I'll just uh, end it there and remind you that it looks like maybe for one or two more minutes the recording device will be on, so Big Brother will be watching and listening. <laughs> Too bad my shoulder is sore. I can't. Oh, that was great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it.